For the first reading today, I'd like to take a look at Matthew. Matthew in the 18th chapter, beginning reading verse 3. Where it says, And I said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and be as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we find here Jesus speaking, and he starts off with, Except ye be converted and be as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So unless we are converted through baptism and become as little children. So this gives us several options that we have. We can either go without being baptized and skip this all together. We can go and be baptized and stay the same as we were before, not become as little children, and we shall not see the kingdom of heaven. We can skip baptism altogether, become as little children, and not see heaven. But he tells us, except we be converted, we be baptized, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we have to do both of these things before we have a chance to go to that kingdom in heaven. The fourth verse, Whosoever thou sh therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He also tells us uh, the servant is basically the greatest in heaven. The one that is most humble, the one that is most lowly, the one that is of the lowest rank, or the person that uh, believes of themselves as the lowest rank is greater than all those that believe they are so much higher in society and they are so much higher around the people they are with. In the fifth verse, And whoso shall receive one such child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone be hanged around his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. So we find here in this recording that uh, Matthew took of the things that Jesus said, that Jesus is showing us the way that we should live through this little child that was among them. What's the main differences between a little child and a grown person? I mean, grown people have been around, they've seen things, they've learned things. They've become confident in the knowledge of the things that they have seen, the things that they know, and the things they believe they know, which they don't really know. Whereas a child is not really confident. A child is more questioning, trying to figure out things. They accept that they're of lowly stature because that's the way they started. They don't know any other way. I mean, when you're a child, you're born to your parents and you depend on your parents for absolutely everything. You depend on the people around you for absolutely everything. You don't become rich and powerful depending on other people to do things. But you do become a great servant. You do become the type of person that Christ would have us to be. Because even though we are grown and we have experienced things and we have learned things and we become confident in some things, confidence in uh, some things that we shouldn't be confident in because we don't really know, we still have this depending nature. We still depend on God to give us the things that we need. And I believe that's exactly the way that Christ is trying to put this to us. I and mean, we can read in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and beginning in the fifth verse, where it says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge their borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms of feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. 
and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. And this is what we read a few Sundays ago. But he's talking about the people that were uh, higher in the uh, Jewish community at this time. He's talking about the Pharisees and all those that were of the ruling class. So, saying how they love the works that they do to be seen by men. I mean, you've got to figure the people that were working in the uh, temple in order to make the temple working. They would take the sacrifice that the people would give them, and they would give that sacrifice to the Lord for the benefit of the people. A man doing that can easily get to view that he's more important than anyone else because they're passing things on to him for him to do to somebody else that they can't do that for. Because at this time, it was the priests that were the ones that were able to do the sacrifices and of those uh, class that were able to give the sacrifices on behalf of the people saying how they loved the uppermost rooms of feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. They love in the synagogues to sit in the important places, the places where everybody can see you. And the greetings in the marketplace to be called Rabbi, Rabbi, or Teacher, Teacher. The eighth verse. But be, ye, be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all your brethren... All ye are brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. Christ is telling us don't call people rabbi, rabbi. Don't call them master. Don't call them father. Because we have one that fulfills all those positions above us, and that is God. God is our teacher. God is our master. God is the one who created us, created all the little cells that came together to build into what we see today. And without God doing all that, we are absolutely nothing. And he goes on here in the 11th verse, But he that is the greatest among you, shall be your servant. Continuing in the 12th verse. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So Christ is telling us how we should be. We've already got our master. We've already got our teacher. We've already got our father, which is God. So he says that the greatest among us shall be our servant. What kind of life did Jesus come down in this world to live? He could have been given to uh, some ruler. I mean, we saw it with Moses. Moses was born into a lowly position. He was uh, moved into a higher position to the Pharaoh's family, and he was raised as one of the Pharaoh's uh, grandkids. Whereas Jesus didn't have any of that. Jesus was born to a uh, lowly woman, the man on this earth that took care of him was a carpenter. Carpenter wasn't the... A carpenter was not the lowest level of people because the carpenter had to have a lot of skill, had to have a lot of ability in order to do the works that he did. I mean, if anyone was lower than a carpenter, it would have to be a fisherman. And where did Jesus go to get his other people? So he was born to this woman, was raised with this family, learning how to do carpentry and how to do the work that that family did. 
And what else did he do? He taught people. He washed feet. He prayed for people. He helped heal people. He didn't take charge of everybody. He would walk around and tell them things that they need to know and show them miracles, which caused people to follow him. I mean, if there was one man who was walking around right among us today and then somebody was sick, all they had to do is just touch that person and that person would be healed, that person was walking away. Why would we stay here and just sit with our jobs? Why not go with that person that can make everything that's hurting us go away? I mean, in this time, there's food around, but food wasn't the easiest thing to get. It's not like we have today where instead of going out and fishing, we have farms where they actually grow fish and uh, containers and holes in the ground so they could pull the fish out and uh, have the fish cut up so we can eat them. It was a lot harder back then. You had to go into the lakes. You had to go into the Mediterranean Sea, and you had to find where the schools of fish were so you could throw your nets out and try to grab them. It was a very lowly life in the life that Jesus came down in this world and lived. And most of the people that Jesus raised up, the disciples and the apostles, were of a very lowly stature for the most part of them. For he says, any who shall exalt himself shall be abased. Any, any of us that lifts ourselves up in society, lifts ourselves up in importance, shall be abased, shall be put down to nothing. And those that shall humble themselves, who put themselves down, Christ will raise up. Next, take a look in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, begin reading verse 20, where it says, For I fear the lest, when I shall come unto you, I shall not find you in such as I would. So Paul is telling him, he fears that when he comes unto this church at Corinth, he will not find them as he wants them to be. As he continues on, and that I would, <clears throat> I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be, lest there be debates, envies, wrath, strifes, backbiting, whispering, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the unclean and fornication and lavishness which they have committed. So Paul is basically telling this church at Corinth that he is going to come unto them. And he is afraid he's going to find them in a position that he doesn't want to find them in. What kind of position does Paul want to find this church in Corinth in? He wants to find them in a peaceful position. He wants to find them in an the eager to learn position. As it tells us, we should hunger. And if we hunger after righteousness, we will be fed. We will be filled with righteousness. But if we're not hungering after righteousness, if we're hungering after power, if we're hungering after the things that we can have and the things we can be, that leads us away from righteousness. And he tells us the things that he heard from them, that there are uh, debates and envyings and wraths and strifes and backbiting and all the things that he doesn't want to see from them. All the things showing that they are not a cohesive unit. They're fighting and they're causing problems and they're not able to stay together, not able to be of one heart, as the scriptures tell us that we should be. And he's saying when he comes, 
that God will humble him among the people so he could be as a servant and he can not be powerful to force them to do what he wants, what God wants. But he can be as a servant. He can help them. He can help guide them through God's power in order to put them right. Next, take a look in Philippians. In Philippians, the second chapter, begin reading verse 5. Where it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, though it not be robbery to be equal with God, thought it not to be equal robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So in this letter to the Philippians, brethren, being told how they should live after the example which Jesus lived. Because Jesus had a lot of power, which he used from time to time, but he did not use it to show that he had power. He used it to draw the people in so the people could hear what he had to say. I mean, we see the same thing today. If you go to a big city and you see a person standing on a street corner saying all the manner of things that they want to say, how many people pay attention to them? But they had that ability just to reach out and heal somebody just with a touch. What would the difference be? But Jesus made himself of no reputation, took the form of a servant... Looking just as men do, being obedient. Jesus wasn't the master. His master was the Father. His master was the one he prayed to and said, Father, if it be, take this cup from me, but not as I will, as thou wilt. Christ didn't show he had great power at that time, but he showed he had great trust. He showed that he had a very strong belief that if he followed and did the things that he was sent here to do, that he would be taken care of. And just as we are told, if we humble ourselves, if we become obedient, if we abase ourselves, we shall be exalted in the end. Next, take a look in Colossians, the third chapter. In Colossians, the third chapter, uh, begin reading verse 12, where it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do ye. So here he's telling us we should be holy, or we should be set apart from the people of this world. Beloved in the bowels of mercy. Our bowels are made for the few specific jobs, mainly to take the things that come in to our bodies and use them in order to keep our bodies functioning. And bowels of mercy, comparing them to bowels of mercy, bowels that take the things in from this world 
and treat it with mercy, treat it with kindness and humbleness of mind so that our spiritual bodies can grow and continue to live with meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving as Christ forgave the people that had done wrong to him and done wrong to God. Next, take a look at James, the fourth chapter, where he tells us how we should not be. In James, the fourth chapter, beginning in the fourth verse, where he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity of God? Whosoever, therefore, shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So he makes it straight and plain to us. Those who are a friend to the things of this life are an enemy to God. Which is why we should be holy. We should be separate from the things of this world and follow after the things of God while living in this world as Christ showed us. The fifth verse. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us, Lust to envy. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So we're told, beginning in this reading how we are not to be. We're not to be a friend of the world. We're not to follow after the things of this world. But we are to be holy. We're to be separate from this world, living in this world. As the scriptures say, that those who abase themselves, those who put themselves lower in the levels of importance in this world, God, God will exalt that's the way he clearly puts it. So those of us who are living in this world, but not living after the things of this world, who submit ourselves to God, trusting that he will take care of us, resisting the devil, and the devil will flee from us. That's exactly how it says it in the seventh verse. We're living in this world, we can spiritually draw closer to God, and He will draw closer to us. Cleansing our hands and cleansing our bodies of all the sins, all the impurities, all the problems of this world, cleansing it from our bodies and getting rid of it from our bodies, and God will draw nigh into us. Because as Christ lived on this world as a person, he lived blameless. He lived sinless. And in the end, blame was put on to him for things that he didn't do wrong. And as we're told in the 10th verse, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. So if we're able to live in this world, but put away all the cares and problems of this world, and live following after God, he will draw nigh to us. And if we humble ourselves before him, he will lift us up. If we put ourselves down to the floor for him, he will raise us up higher. And then take a look in uh, 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. Begin reading verse 5. Here where you have the Peter who had been around for a long time trying to 
help the church that he had seen, he had helped build. But even as Paul and everyone else who helped build the church, in places they can see there are problems just as today. Anyone who goes around and builds the church and to make it stronger, whenever they go away, whenever they uh, move on to another section, there are going to be people that turn back the other way. And in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, beginning verse 5, says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and to be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. So he tells us the younger should submit themselves to the elders or the people who have not learned, have not grown in the spiritual knowledge would submit themselves to the people who have more experience, have grown, have become stronger in spiritual knowledge and doing the things after the way God has set. Just as the churches are to be led by the group of elders that are in the church, the group of people that have learned and have grown and have experienced and are able to teach the younger people how they should do things, those are the ones that the younger should submit themselves to. As it says, being clothed with humility, for God resisted the proud. God doesn't take after the proud people. As it says, those who lift themselves up God will abase. And those that abase themselves, God will lift up. As it continues on in the sixth verse, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So we're told to humble ourselves before God and put all our cares unto God. Let God take care of all our cares. Because he can deal with it a lot better than we can. We're told to be sober, to be vigilant, to be not being a drunkard, but being clear-minded able to see what's going on and being vigilant, able to take a look at the small details, because as it says, the devil's in the details. You can do something that is good, but if you put evil into doing something that is good, it's not as good as it was before. We've torn it down. But being vigilant of all the little things that we need to do, all the little parts that need to be right so we may be humble among God and not lifting ourselves up. And he will protect us from the devil, which is, as it says, is a roaring lion walking about trying to figure who he can devour. And the ninth verse, whom resisteth steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So after we abase ourselves, and we follow after the things, trusting on God, putting all our cares, all our concerns, all our worries unto God. Where we suffer for a while. Even Jesus, when he came down to this world, suffered for a while. For God to make us perfect, to establish us, to strengthen us, to make us stronger, and to settle us to settle us in life forever with Him. None of us are complete. None of us are perfect. None of us are the way that we need to be. But if we put our cares and our hopes unto God, 
and we thirst after the things which God has told us. He will teach us to make us perfect and strengthen us to make us stronger in His Word so He can settle us in the ways that we need to live on this earth and the way we get to live if we are found living a pleasing life unto His sight in the life after this. I thank you for this time. I hope that everything that's been said has been found in accordance with the Word. And I thank you very much.